morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Let's stand. Let's worship together. Good morning. We're glad you're here today. Glad you're part of our worship service. And uh, we're going to begin this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to come together to worship your name. Father, we thank you for this season and the reminder that you came to earth as a child, as an infant, to grow up, to become a man who would die on the cross for our sins. And Father, may we ever be reminded of that during this season as we celebrate with family and friends and the joy that's a part of it. Now be with us this morning as we worship. May we praise you for who you are. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
time. If you want to be prayed for this morning, please come and y'all come on with them and let's pray for folks this morning. Come on, folks. Let's lay hands on these folks and pray for them. We're glad you're here today. While you're coming, let me give you a little information. Well, by the way, uh, before we start the prayer time, let me remind you about your tear outs in your bulletin so you can put down your attendance for a day. If you're visiting with us today, if you fill out one of those teared out in the bulletin, drop it in for your offering later. We sure appreciate that. We can have a record of your visit and follow through. Uh, but also on your deal, when you fill that out later, you know, while you're bored while I'm preaching or sometime, fill that out. And we, we have got the concrete poured in the back now for the new food pantry edition. <laughs> Amen. And so we, have, we met this week, and we've decided we're not going to try to start that building during the holidays, so we're going to start, I should say during Christmas, okay? Uh, we're going to start the 1st of January. If you would be willing to help us some with construction, if you'll just circle the letter C on your form when you put your name on it, and you'll get, it, get information when we decide to start putting the walls up, all right? Okay. Um, Another neat little story, it's, 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 it, it had a good ending. Uh, some of you remember P Patricia Sobliski, and uh, she's, uh, she's related to uh, Deidre Green, it's her aunt. And uh, so during COVID in the first round, uh, she um, was watching online. And in those early days, I prayed the sinner's prayer almost every Sunday online because I knew people were watching us from all over. And she prayed to receive Christ. She acknowledged that on the, on the Facebook uh, site. We followed up on her and had a chance to discuss her decision with her. In July, she came after things cleared up a little, and I had the opportunity to baptize her here. Uh, she, as we've been praying for her the last couple of weeks, she'd been really sick. She passed away last Sunday. And the family asked me to come and preach her funeral in DeCoin on Thursday. And they said, would you be willing to do that? I said, it'd be an honor. It'd be an honor. Full house. And I got to share the gospel with all of those folks. Um, but she's with the Lord now, and her family's very grateful that she got saved, and she's with the Lord now. Also, as you well know, um, Teresa Tumbleson, who we've been praying for for years and has had 11 years of extended life by the Lord, uh, went to be with the Lord this week. Her funeral was yesterday. There'll be a family burial today. And so please keep... Uh, that family in your prayers as well. Carla Marsh's dad, Don Webb, had a uh, pacemaker put in this week. It didn't go well. They had to go back in Friday night and do more surgery. They still can't keep his blood pressure up, and he's still in the hospital. So remember Don Webb in prayer as well. And then I'll just kind of get through the rest of these as we pray, all right? So let's go to the Lord and, and pray for those. Father, we pray for these families that have lost loved ones. We pray for the Bliski family and Father, we just pray that you'd be with them in a mighty way. They'd feel your presence. I, I pray that the gospel that was shared at, at, at Trisha's funeral, Lord, would, that Trisha's funeral, Lord, would, would touch hearts and lives and people would give their hearts and lives to you, Lord. I, I, I pray for the Tumbleson family, Lord. And, and uh, Teresa, just, Lord, just loved you so much and everybody could see it in her. And we thank you, Lord, that now she's with you. 
And we pray you'd be with the family and that you'd just bring them peace and comfort in the days ahead. We pray for Don Webb, Lord, in the hospital. And Father, we just pray you'd reach out and touch him in a mighty way. And Father, we also pray for Lloyd Pruitt, who's also in the hospital, or at least he was as of yesterday. Uh, Father, struggling with his uh, gravis. And Father, we just pray you reach out and touch him as well. Father, we pray for Christy Hawkins, and we just pray you continue to reach out and touch her. And Father, that you'd uh, bless her in a mighty way. Y'all reach over and touch Christy. Will you? Where, where is she at? She up here. Y'all put a hand on Christy. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of his shed blood that she would be set free totally and completely from this cancer. Father, that tumor would be completely gone. We thank you, Lord, that it's under control and she's doing well. But Father, we pray for complete and total healing. And then, Lord, we pray for Janet Sullivan. Father, we just pray you continue to bless her, Dave's wife, that watches us every week. And Father, we pray you'd be there as she goes into this next round of chemo. And Father, that you just watch over her. And we pray again in the name of Jesus and by the power of his shed blood that that cancer would be gone. You all lay hands on Lana right here. Lana this week has a test. And so, Lord, we pray for Lana. And we pray that test is going to show that her cancer is cured, that it's gone. And we pray, Lord, that test would be very successful. And we pray you continue to be with her. And we thank you, Lord, that you've been with her through the journey that she's been on. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for Beverly Self today. And we pray you reach out and touch her. And, Father, that you just draw her close to you, Lord. And, and Father, that um, you give her strength and everything that she needs one day at a time. And, Father, we pray for Ellen Baldwin. Father, we pray you would reach out and touch her. And, Father, your healing hands would be upon her and move in her life. And, Lord, we pray for... Hannah Caldwell, and Father, we just pray that, that uh, you'd reach out and touch her. She's fighting this disease, and it's a difficult thing. It's been hard for Bob and the joy and the family, and I just pray you'd bless them, and Father, that you'd touch her and heal her. Pray for Andy Amelon, Lord. We pray you continue to be at work in her life. And Father, we pray for Kendra's, Kendra's dad, Jeff Bullinger. And uh, Father, we last we knew he was in the hospital on a vent with COVID, and Father, we just pray that, that you would just reach out and touch him in a mighty way, bring healing into his body in a mighty way. And then we're going to play, pray for my wife. If y'all just put a hand on Cindy over here. And Lord, we pray for Cindy right now. And Father, we just pray that with the multiple things that seem to be going on right now, Lord, that you just be in control. Father, that you would reach out and touch her in a mighty way. Your healing hands would be upon her as she has a PET scan a week from Monday, Lord. I, I pray that we'd get results that would, would uh, be wonderful, Lord, that would show that you're moving and healing that cancer. Father, just move in a mighty way in her life, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Is there anybody else here who wants to be prayed for this morning? Anybody else up here wants to be prayed for this morning? God, we just pray that as we close this prayer that I know there are other prayer requests that have not been mentioned. There are others that have not come up and said, I want you to pray for me, but Lord, there are others with special needs all over this auditorium and even watching online. So, Father, we pray you'd reach out and touch them. They feel your grace, your presence, your healing hands, and your power. And they'd walk within that power. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You step down from heaven. Humbly you came. God.
You may be seated.
And yes, if you're wondering, that's rain. Um, or Noah spread stuff all over the place. He must have left his windows down. <laughs> I've never seen Noah move that fast before. I don't know about you, but I choose joy. Man, doesn't the Christmas decorations look good? Then our ladies do a great job. And if you didn't notice when you came in, there's a new nativity scene out on the lawn that they got for us. And so we're, we're thrilled about that. It is the Christmas season. What better time than to choose joy than during the Christmas season? Uh, I want to begin with a word of prayer because I, I left out a couple of things. Don Francis' his brother, if you don't know who Don is, he's the guy that plays the bass up here most Sundays. And if you don't know what the bass is, it's the one with only four strings. <laughs> uh, some of them have five. But anyway, Don lost his uh, brother this week, and the funeral was yesterday. And so we remember his family in prayer as well. And Mike McReynolds, is, is he still in the hospital? Does anybody know? Okay. As of yesterday, he was still in the hospital. So we remember those two as well. So let's just go ahead and go to the Lord right now for, for those two. Father, I thank you for Don. I thank you for his service here at the church. I, I thank you, Lord, for... Uh, his family, and I know he's got a big family. We talked yesterday, and, and Father, our Friday night, I, I just pray, Lord, that you'd reach out and touch him and his whole family in a mighty way in the loss of their brother. Father, just be with them in a, in a very special way, and may they feel your presence and your love. Lord, we pray for Mike McReynolds. We know he's your child, and Father, we just pray you'd reach out and touch him as well, and, and Father, that you'd bring healing to his body, and Father, that he would get to come home and and, Father, uh, move on with his life. So, Father, just bring healing to him in a mighty way. Lord, as we approach your throne today, Father, as we approach your throne right now, Lord, we come before you. And, Lord, we kneel before you because you are almighty God. Lord, I'm reminded of, I'm reminded, Lord, of those who came to Bethlehem and they kneeled before the Lord in the manger. Father, help us to bow our hearts to you right now, if not our knees. And Father, I pray that you would take control of this time and you would use it for your glory. Father, speak through me, but help me to speak your words and not mine. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're kind of took a little break from the series, The True Marks of a Believer, but kind of we didn't really. Just kind of review, first we, we, we uh, saw that to be a true believer, you have to be born again. The next two weeks, we talked about the fact that a true believer prays and, and understands what prayer does in their life. I'm amazed how many Christians have no prayer life and they're walking powerless before God because they have no prayer life. And so we are commanded to pray. The next four weeks, we're supposed to be on uh, a true believer is in fellowship and community. And so the first week was we have the same faith and the same hope within us. The second week was we have grace and humility within that community of believers. The third week was a spirit of love. And uh, then we kind of took a little break for that. And we did the 23rd Psalm, which a true believer obviously can be much affected by the 23rd Psalm. And then last week I preached on Christ is enough. And for the true believer, Christ is enough. But I want to get back to finish the last week of the a true believers in fellowship and community. Again, the first week was we had the same faith and same hope. Second week was we have grace and humility within that community. The third week was we have a spirit of love within that community. And this week is uh, this week is agape love. That love is agape love. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you haven't figured that out yet. And so you might be turning there. I know it's going to be on the screen as, as well. I believe with all of my heart that we have let the lost world, the liberal lost world, steal love and they've changed the definition of what love is and they think they know what love is and they think that when we stand on the principles of God that we don't have love and so we've allowed them to take God's term and steal it and use it for the wrong way because love is honoring God love comes from God love is God God is love 
And so you can't say, I love, and at the same time dishonor God because it's not possible. You might like, but you don't really love if you're dishonoring God. And so we want to look at what real agape love is this morning. And by the way, well, let's just do it this way. There are three E words that I want to use in the, to keep us on target. So three-part message, three E words. In order to make them fit E, they're a little bit difficult, but I'll explain them to you, all right, just in case. So three E's about God's love, God's agape love in this chapter. Let's start with verse 1. In verse 1, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Let's break that down. If I speak in the tongues of men, if I speak in our language, tongues of men, okay? The tongues of men for most of us is English. Uh, some of us know a tiny bit of Spanish. Some of you know a lot of Spanish. Some of us know a little bit of Romanian or different things. But basically, the tongues of men is what we understand when we speak to each other. And by the way, it says if you don't have love, you're just a clanging symbol. And so speaking in the tongues of men and speaking in English and saying, I love you, but not living or acting like you love is, is false. It's got to be backed up by a life that loves. It's real easy to say, I love you. It's real hard to show it. It's real hard to show it. And then he says, if I speak with the tongues of angels. The tongues of angels are heavenly languages. And then he says, but I have not love. You see, this first E is God's love is enriching. Enriching. It means that God's love makes our life better. It enriches our life. It changes who we really are. When the love of God, the agape love of God, comes into your heart on the day that you get saved and begins to rule and reign in your life, it enriches our life. It changes our life. It changes who we really are. And without love, no matter what gift God's given you, if you're exercising it without love, you're just noise. You're just noise. When we fail to love, that's how important this chapter is. When we fail to love, we are failing God and we are not walking in the Spirit of God. If you're walking in hate, discord, upset, you're failing to love, you're not walking in the Spirit of God. Not displaying the marks of a true believer because a true believer walks in agape love. A true believer lives in agape love. Yes, we all mess up sometimes, but basically a true believer is somebody that loves the way God loves. Verse 2. Remember, God's love is enriching. That's where we're at. Point one, one verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I have the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecy is preaching. If I can preach better than anyone else and understand the word of God better than anybody else, and yet I don't love those that I preach to, I'm wasting my breath. I'm wasting my time. I'm not walking with God. If you have, the, uh, some of you preach occasionally, if you have the chance to do that and you don't love the people you preach to, you might as well not preach. Now let's put it to where a lot of you are. Many of you are teachers here in the church. And if I can understand all the Scripture, all the mysteries, if I have all of that knowledge, and man, I can really put it out there, but I don't love the people I'm teaching, if I don't love the people I'm teaching, then I'm just making noise. Just making noise. In Ephesians 4.15, Paul tells them that they should combat false teaching, false teaching. Combat false teaching by speaking the truth in love. We should combat false teaching. Some people don't like it when you combat false teaching. But we should be very positive about what the Word of God says. We should know what the Word of God says. And when we hear something that doesn't line up with the Word of God, we should be willing to say it. But we're to say it in love. It's not to be hate. It's not to be hateful. It's not to be combative. It's to be said in love. But yes, you say it because you care. You care. And he says, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. What good is faith if it's not motivated 
by love. True faith in the Savior that causes you to have that mark of the true believer, that has, us, has you to walk in his ways, true faith will bring God's love into your life. You see, God's love, again, has enriched our lives. It has made us rich. Did you know you're rich? Do you know you're rich? I, I'm not talking about your bank account. I'm not talking about where you live. I'm not talking about things you have. I'm not talking about the toys that you have, and I'm not talking to the kids. I'm talking to the men. I, I, I'm not talking about the toys, okay? We are rich with God's Spirit. We are children of the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are heirs to eternal life. We are heirs to it all. We are rich, and yet we live like we're paupers, and we don't pray, and we don't love like he would have us to love. God has enriched our lives. God has taught us to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, now about brotherly love, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. When you get the Holy Spirit of God into your life, when you get saved, and the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart and your life, the Spirit of God teaches you how to love each other. So what does that mean when you're having trouble loving somebody? It means you're not listening to the Spirit of God in your life, and he's not controlling you. God taught us to love one another. God the Father taught us how to love by sending his Son. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. Well, that, that person is pretty hard to love. Well, guess what? The Savior of the world, the Son of the living God, went on the cross and he died for my sins and for yours. And we're hard to love too. But he loved us anyway, didn't he? He didn't love us because we were perfect. He didn't love us because we always said the right things. He didn't love us because we always agreed with everything he said, even though we should. He loved us because he loved us. That's the only reason. He loved us with a sacrificial love. God the Son taught us to love by giving his life. So, you know, God taught us to love. God the Father sent his Son. God the Son taught us to love by giving his life for us and commanding us to love one another. John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. What were some of the old com commandments? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not uh, bear false witness, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's stuff or his wife, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus said, oh, I had a command just as important as the other ones. What's the new command? What is it? The new command is love one another. It's just as big a sin not to love each other as it is to lie. It really is. Or any of those other Ten Commandments that we all know about. You see, the Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts, thereby allowing us to love one another. You can't do this on your own. My goodness, you can't trump up that kind of love on your own for everybody. But the Holy Spirit pours his his love into us, this agape love, and gives us the ability to love each other. John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Wow. People should be able to look at this body of believers. People should be able to look at Christians from other bodies of believers, and people should be able to look at when Christians come together from different bodies of believers and see there is such a love there that they see Jesus. What was the last thing Jesus prayed before he went to the cross? He prayed for you, and he prayed for me. And he prayed, Father, I pray that they will love us and they'll love one another. When we love each other, God's Spirit is glorified. And when we attack each other and we talk badly about each other, God's Spirit is not glorified, and people don't want to be a part of that. You see, agape love is a fruit of the Spirit. We should be loving and kind to the point that it attracts unbelievers to Christ. And a forgiving and a loving spirit is the true character of all true believers. Many people that 
call themselves Christians don't live like that. They don't have that kind of love in their lives. They're either not Christians at all or they're backslidden, and they don't have that kind of love because we are to have that kind of love. Lord Jesus, help us to love with agape love. Help us to overlook each other's faults and continue to love with agape love. Lord, I pray that that you would move in our hearts and lives in such a way with your spirit and your love would be so magnified in our hearts and our lives that it can't help but spill over to those around us. Father, I pray that that agape love would cover a multitude of sins. Father, that as we love with that kind of love, we would look past the person's faults and we would look at their heart and see Jesus and love like you loved us. Help us, Lord, to do that. Second E, first one is, God's love is enriching. The second one is it is edifying. Edifying means God's love builds us up. First, it changes our lives and makes us better. Secondly, it builds us up. It is edifying. Verse 4 says, love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. Love is patient and love is kind. The Christians were, the Corinthians were impatient in public meetings. But if they were living in the love of Christ, they would be long-suffering instead. It means just what it says. Love is patient and love is kind. Some people seem insufferable. Some people are hard to deal with. But real love is patient. It's kind. It overlooks faults and the hang-ups of others. And we all have them, don't we? When we, we say in Celebrate Recovery, it's all about our hang-ups, our faults, our hang-ups. We all have hang-ups. We all have places we fail. Love overlooks that because it's kind and it's patient. And by the way, kindness implies actively doing good things for others. A little advertisement goes with that. Angel Tree Ministry angels are out on the table this morning. What is that? It's where you take a child, an angel, you become their angel, you buy them a Christmas, and you bring it back, and it's delivered to them, and it's delivered in the name of the mother, the father, grandfather, grandmother that's in prison. And so that child whose parent or grandparent is in prison gets a Christmas from that person in prison. No, you don't get any credit. Do you need any? It's kindness. It's kindness. I'd urge you to get an angel this morning and do that because God's love is kind. It does not envy. They were envying each other's possessions. They were envying each other's gifts. Some had more stuff than other people. Some had better gifts, they thought, than others. But love would remove that envy. I'm always amazed when Christians are jealous of other people because they don't have what they have. We love somebody. We, don't, we want the best for them, don't we? Do we care what they have? We want the best for them if we love them. It doesn't envy, and it doesn't boast, and it's not proud. They were puffed up with pride. But when we really love, it removes that pride, and it gives us a desire to promote others instead of ourselves. Verse 5, God's love continues to be edifying. Verse 5, it, it's not rude. It's not self-seeking. You, know, you have to look and say, what are the real motives be behind the things that I do? Remember, at the Lord's Supper table, they were behaving very badly. Each one worried about himself. But real love is not rude, and it's not self-seeking. Look at the illustration of marriage. Isn't it true that so many times we're more rude to the people we love the most than anybody else because we think we can get away with it, I guess. I don't know. And isn't it true that many times in our marriages, if we're not careful, we are self-seeking and it's really about what we want instead of what's best for our partner? And when I say partner, I mean husband or wife. You know what I mean by that. You see, so many times that's what causes a marriage to fail. Because the two become one flesh, the Bible says. 
And if one person in that marriage is all about themselves and never for the other person, the marriage is going to fail. Same way in the church. It's exactly the same way in the church. We shouldn't be rude to each other. And we shouldn't be self-seeking in the church. It shouldn't be about what I want. It shouldn't be about what you want. It should be about what God wants. It's not self-seeking. Verse 5 says, it's not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Wow, some people get offended so easily, and they never forget. You know, I've heard people say, oh, I've forgiven you, but I haven't forgotten. He hasn't forgiven me. They never forget. It tends to come back up from time to time, doesn't it? Because it's not really ever been forgiven. It's not easily angered. It, it keeps no record of wrongs. People that keep a record of wrongs are, are not living in love or in control of God's spirit. Matthew 6, 14 says, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And I, I think marriage is another great illustration of this. If you're, if you're keeping track of when your spouse messed up and digging it up every time something goes wrong, you've not forgiven, and you're not going to have the marriage that you need to have. We need to let those things go, don't we? We just need to let them go. And, and it's the same way in the church family. My goodness, I've been your pastor for 24 and a half years. I probably offended all of you at one time or the other. I mean, how do, you, how do you know somebody that long without making them mad at least once? I mean, let's be honest, right? But the question is not, did Brother Mitch do something to me 25 years ago? The question is, did you forgive him and move on? And yeah, I've been offended a few times along the way too, but I'm going to continue to love. I'm going to continue to choose joy. I'm going to continue to be who God has called me to be. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. Show me a liberal who says that all lifestyles are okay and everything is okay. There are no holds barred. You can live however you want. It's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. I'll show you someone that's not filled with God's love. I don't care if they say they love and they say that they accept everybody for who they are, no matter what it is, use the right pronouns, all that kind of stuff. I don't care what they say. The bottom line is they are not having real love because real love is concerned about that person, not just trying to please them, but concerned enough to tell them the truth about who they are. And if God's love is in me, I care about your life here and in your eternal destiny. And if I really care about who you are and what your life is on this earth and what your life's going to be in the future, then with love, I'm going to be willing to tell you the truth about what your life is like, based on the Word of God, not based on my opinion, based on the Word of God. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's a hard thing to do. But love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in truth that comes from the Word of God. Verse 7, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preveres. Marriage illustration again, a good marriage. It protects, you protect each other. You protect each other, don't you? I mean, if you've got a good marriage, you protect each other. You know, if somebody says something about your wife, you ought to be going Papa Bear on them. If somebody says something about your husband, you ought to be going Mama Bear on them because you protect each other. You trust each other. You trust each other. You don't worry about where they're at every minute because you trust them. You don't have to put a tracker on their cell phone so you know where they go because you trust them. You hope together. It always hopes. Love always hopes. You hope together for a wonderful future. You hope for it so much that you work towards it. And it always perseveres. You see, a good marriage protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. It lasts a lifetime. Real love, real love protects. It trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. It's forever. It's forever. The agape love that should be in all of our hearts 
should make this church family exactly what it ought to be before God, just like it should make your marriage what it ought to be before God. Oh, God, that we could live in that kind of a way, that we could always trust you, that we could always protect, and we could always hope in you, and we, we, we could always love forever the way that you love. And Lord, we know we are weak, and Lord, we know that we are frail, and Lord, we know that we fail in that so many times, but when we do, Lord, convict our hearts. Touch our hearts and show us that we're failing to love the way you would have us to love. The final E, enriching, edifying, and enduring. That's easy. It's forever. It's forever. Verse 8, love never fails. But where there are prophecies or preaching, that'll cease. Where there are tongues, heavenly languages, they'll be stilled. Uh, where there's knowledge, it will pass away. You see, those were the gifts that the Corinthians prized the most. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament yet. And so because they didn't have the New Testament, when they would gather to worship, the Holy Spirit would lead them, and somebody would get a prophecy from the Lord, or, or somebody might get a message delivered in tongues, and somebody would interpret it, and, and God gave the knowledge of that interpretation. And so they had to depend on the Holy Spirit to teach them because the Word of God uh, didn't include the New Testament yet. It hadn't been written yet. And so they didn't have that. And so those were gifts that they, they honored, that they valued because it helped them to worship but look at verse 8 says, it will pass away. These gifts will pass away. They will cease. But love is forever. Wow. Love is forever. Because 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Love is forever. You know, when you read about heaven, it says there will be no giving in marriage and no marriage in heaven. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I hope I still get to live in Cindy's mansion. But I can tell you one thing I know. I'll still love her there. And she'll still love me there. And those that we love, we'll still love in heaven. Those that we love here on this earth, we'll know them in heaven. And we'll love them in an even better way because we'll be perfect. We'll love them in an even stronger way because love endures forever. Verses 9 and 10, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfection disappears. Those gifts, those temporary gifts, they're not going to be needed anymore when heaven comes. They're imperfect gifts. Verse 11 says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Children live for the temporary. You know that, right? Mommy, I want a piece of candy. You can't have one right now. Supper's in 15 minutes. <laughs> I know your kids never did any of that. They live for the temporary. It's all about the moment. It's all about what I want right now. But the bottom line is that adults don't live that way. But the Corinthians were like little children playing with toys that one day disappear. But there's a maturing process for the believer that will not be completed until we reach heaven. If you think you are a mature Christian right now, you're not there yet, and neither am I. We won't be completely mature in the Lord until the day we enter heaven. Up until then, we're going to be struggling with our faults. We're going to be struggling with our problems. We're going to be struggling with our sin up until that very day. But hopefully, we are growing more and more mature as the years go by. Young people, y'all look at me for a minute, okay? I see you're playing, writing, doing all kinds of stuff. I know you're taking notes on the sermon, okay? But look at me for a minute. Never, never, never look down on the wisdom of age. There is a maturing process that takes place as we grow in the Lord, and as we live those years. And so, yeah, they may not understand the cool clothes that you wear. They may not understand some of the language you use. They may not understand the latest thing. But let me tell you, they understand the Word of God and what life's all about. So never look down on age. And I know you don't because, after all, David's old, right? And so, so I know you don't. Well, he's older than me, at least a, a year or two. <laughs> no, I know you don't. But don't ever do that. Always... You know, I, I hear young people and they make fun of old people because they dress funny and, they, and they, they don't wear the cool styles and 
and, you know, whatever. There's always reasons. They don't have any hair. I mean, I don't know what the reasons are, but they make fun of old folks. But I want you to understand in, in the Christian community, there's wisdom with age. Never look down on that. Whoa, there's a wasp on me. Get behind me, Satan. I'm a little afraid of wasps, but I don't know why. Man. Let's go back to verse 11 and get back to this. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish things away. The maturing process should be going on in our life as we grow. Y'all that are seniors or in, in, uh, out of high school ought to be more mature spiritually than those in seventh and eighth grade. And one of the things that takes place in a youth group, I've seen it work both ways. The older kids don't want to have to do with the younger kids because they're immature. But the bottom line is God wants you to mentor those younger kids and be a part of seeing them grow as well. Something else just flew by. Verse 12, now we see a poor reflection in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. In the New Testament, we have God's complete revelation. But our understanding of it, even so, is only partial. We will understand it all clearly someday. And then we will know when we've been short-sighted in the past. He sometimes as Christians, we don't really understand everything we should understand about the Word of God and how we to live. We don't listen to the Holy Spirit. And we become very short-sighted in how we love, how we forgive, and how we treat each other. Because we're not mature like we should be. I love verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Everything else is going to be gone. All the other gifts are gone. Only three things remain when you get to heaven. Faith, hope, and love. Only three graces that will endure all the way into heaven. But they'll change because when you get to heaven, faith will become sight. You'll see it for yourself. All that that you've had faith in and believed in, the moment you enter heaven, you see it all. So faith becomes sight. Hope what happens to hope when we get to heaven? It's fulfilled. It's fulfilled. What happens to love when we get to heaven? It goes on and on and on and on. God's agape love in us is forever. My Bible tells me in the new heaven, in the new Jerusalem, that God will make his home with men and men will live with God be glorious, isn't it? And you know that kind of love in your life? Do you know God's love that way? Has God's love changed you to the point that you love that way? Does it show in the way you treat others? Let's stand for prayer and invitation time. God, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a beautiful chapter, but it's also a hard chapter. Because as we read it, we are bound to notice that our love is not always measuring up. So, Lord, help us to let your love flow through us in such a way that it measures up. Lord, forgive us when we fail to love like we should and help us to love in a greater way when we're failing. Lord, help us to love those around us no matter what. Help us love to love those who do evil to us. Help us to love those who persecute us. Help us to love those who love us. Lord, help us to love, and we can only do it through the power of your Spirit. Father, is there someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior? Then I pray they come to realize that only with Jesus can they have the kind of love that we're talking about. It only comes from God. Lord, speak to our hearts now as we enter this time of invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come as we sing. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, when I found
ask you just to bow your heads right where you're at. Just do business with God. Ask the Lord. Lord, is my love self-centered? Lord, is it all about me? Oh, Lord, am I filled with the agape love that you've placed in my life? Am I loving others unselfishly? Lord, am I caring about others with the kind of love that would attract others to the kingdom of God? Just do business with God. If you're not aware, Jim is on vacation right now. Let me remind you again, your bulletin has a tear out. It's perforated. You can bend it and tear it out. If you would, make sure you fill that out so we have a record of your, of your being here today. If you're visiting with us, for sure, please fill that out so we can have a record of you uh, visiting with us and we can follow up on that. And so we're just thrilled that you're here if you're visiting with us. And also, you'll see the letters there underneath the names. And circle the letter C if you'd be willing to help with construction starting in January. That doesn't mean you'll be here every day. It doesn't mean you'll be here, you know, all the time. But we'll set a schedule of when, when we're going to be working. And those that you can make, we'd appreciate if you come help us put the things up that need to be put up. Amber, do you have an announcement? Hey, guys. Oh. Um, I'm here uh, for Shannon on my behalf because we want to make sure that you guys are aware of what is coming up for us on the 17th. We're going to be doing this thing called the Gingerbread Bash. And if that doesn't get you excited, let me just tell you, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's got uh, games and nativity scenes made out of gingerbread and uh, songs and all kinds of things. And it's going to be December 17th. It's a Friday night from 6 to 730 here in the gym. We want, you know, if you're interested in coming and having a good time, we want you to be there. We have a sign-up sheet for it in the gym on that, the uh, bulletin board in there. 
And there's some items on there for all of the um, creation of those gingerbread masterpieces. We have lots of candy and uh, cereal pieces and whatever. We have a list of things for suggested items if you would like to donate or bring them with you when you come. So please sign up and be a part of that because um, Shannon found this, and she's, she's like the, the, the brain behind this, and she is super excited. And I'm trying to get on board because uh, there's just um, – I don't know, it's, it's a moment of joy and creativity and fun for families. And so, you know, young, old, families and singles, whoever you are, sign up, come, have lots of fun with us. Invite your friends who don't go here so that we can, it's an opportunity for a ministry and for witnessing to people as well. So we'd love to see you guys there. Okay, that's the 17th. That's good to know because 17th is Cindy and I's 45th anniversary and I've been looking for something special to do. So now we've got something. <laughs> so uh, the gingerbread bash. Um, also, uh, speaking of the children, they'll practice during life groups this morning, and then next Sunday, and they're practicing Saturday too, I believe, it's in the bulletin, and next Sunday night at 5 o'clock will be our children's Christmas program, so you want to look forward to that. It's going to be wonderful. They've worked very, very hard on it, and it's going to be an exciting evening, and we're going to follow that up with another exciting evening on the 19th, and we're going to have a family Christmas service on the 19th. Uh, we'll have families reading scripture. We'll have a candlelight service. We'll do the Lord's Supper on the 19th. Um, we are going to follow that service with a uh, fellowship in the gym, and everybody's supposed to bring their favorite cookie, can cookie Christmas cookies and candy. So we're going to have a good time afterwards as well. We, the, we've got a committee working on that. They've been working very hard on it. It's going to be a great night. And so I don't know who's bringing the milk. Maybe you can bring the milk. <laughs> It'd be after church. Church is five o'clock every Sunday night. Okay, she's working now. Church will be five o'clock every Sunday night until until the time changes. All right. So, uh, in case you had any wonderings about that tonight or today, right after Sunday school, right after life groups at eleven thirty, the deacons will meet in room four twenty. Today at one o'clock, uh, there is a birthday party for Miss Betty Cole, and I believe. He's turning 90. Is that right? 90 is the right age, right? Yeah. It's in the concourse. It's come and go between one and three. Is that, that's, we got that right? Tell me if I don't have it right. Okay, okay. Between one and three, come and go, birthday party in the concourse. Uh, four o'clock, the youth are having rehearsal early so they can come to the concert tonight. And then at five o'clock tonight, we have the farmhands concert let me say it will not be on Facebook, all right, because their materials are copyrighted and they'll be using their own sound system. So if you want to see the farmhands, you have to come and see them in person tonight. They're coming for a free will offering, so we'll be taking an offering for them tonight. Also, at 6 o'clock on Monday is the ladies' ministry Christmas party. And uh, you all know all about that by now, surely. And so uh, then it's... Fr Oh, man, I thought it was 6 a.m. No, I don't, I don't know why it says a.m. No, it's 6 p.m. Uh, Friday, 6 p.m., Sportsman's Banquet Training in room 419. So we have the 30th of April, we are having a huge Sportsman's Banquet. We have rented the, the Minor Convention Center. We're going to be serving a great meal. We're going to have all kinds of giveaways. Uh, Kenny. Evans, who is the singer that we had before for Revival from Pigeon Forge, is going to be here Friday night to train those that are going to be leading this event, and, uh, and we'll be meeting with him Friday night, and then he'll be coming back and doing the event for us on the 30th. By the way, he's doing it for free. He usually charges a lot for that. He's doing it for free, and then he's going to stay over and do Revival from Sunday through Wednesday, and so he'll be here Friday night. Most of you have been asked to be on the committee, or a lot of you have been. You've gotten texts from me. You should get a reminder later if you haven't gotten it already. But if you would like to be part of the leadership team for that exciting event, just show up Friday night. We'd be glad to have you. We'll, we'll assign you a spot to work in. And uh, we have 20 or 30 people that are going to be on that leadership team, and we can always use some more. So if you'd like to be on that leadership team, please show up Friday night, and we will put you in a place of service, all right? Finally, on Saturday, uh, I already said the children are practicing in the auditorium at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the singing Christmas tree trip, the ladies, I guess it's all ladies, are going on or leaving at 8.30 
that morning, okay? And I don't want to forget, out in the lobby, uh, we are building a soup tree. And so bring cans of soup for the tree. And our goal this year for the food pantry is 1,300 cans of soup. We'll go buy a couple hundred cans of soup, but only need five or six of you to do it. We'll have plenty, all right? So anyway, bring your cans of soup with you when you come on Sundays or Wednesdays, and we're going to build a, a Christmas tree, hopefully more than one Christmas tree out there of canned soup for our food pantry. Any other announcements? All right, I think we have a video of the farmhands in just a minute. Ushers, come on and take her off. Sitting in church, singing just as I am. But this time it's more than a song. The preacher said I must give Jesus my heart if I want to make heaven my home. But I said, Lord, what if I still make mistakes? Sometimes I don't read or pray Then a sweet wave of peace swept right over me He said I'll be there each step of the way Just follow me Cause I know the way You would be lost on your way Keep me inside, and you'll be all right, and I'll lead you all the way home. Now Danny's in heaven with Jesus, his Savior, and I know someday I will be, but I still hear those words when I'm facing the darkness keep walking and stay close to me just follow me cause I know the way and you would be lost on your own keep me inside and you'll be alright and I'll lead you all We're going to do a Christmas section tonight, too. We're going to have a good time tonight, so come and be a part of that service. Let's stand for our closing prayer. Joel is our deacon of the week. Joel, lead us in our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, just, uh, I thank you for today, God. I thank you for uh, this church. I thank you for um, uh, the church body, God. I just uh, I ask that you would um, help us to uh, love one another, God, uh, as a church body. I ask that you will help us to uh, show love to um, those we come in contact with this this week, God, and just uh, um, let them see you through us, uh, through our love towards them, God. And I just ask that you will uh, uh, be with us throughout this week and say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.